It's been a wonderful few days here. I've enjoyed every minute of it. Uh, your principal, president, and I over the last few years have gotten to know each other, find, found out that we are born in that same marvelous vintage year, have uh, experienced in Youth for Christ together for some years, and uh, now involved in this kind of leadership. So we have much in common, both as friends and in a professional sense. And that means a great deal to those of us that have these kind of responsibilities. But also to, to be with you, to get to know... She's gone. The rapture has happened. Carol Ann? Oh, there she is. Okay, she's just closer to heaven than I am right now. <laughs> and thank you for all the work that you have done in making this possible, arranging it and putting it together. And uh, just the, the, the joy that I've had in meeting you and Wilma and having lunch and dinners with others of you. Uh, the opportunity of one-on-one -on -one conversation, the Q&As where you ask me questions that I, of things that I've never thought of before and you have to spin on your feet and trying to find a response. That's always energizing. But also to be with you because we have a common love. Uh, our common love draws us together. Our, the ballast of this old ship of Zion is, is the Lord Jesus, uh, whom we love and whom we know love us. And in that, we work together in the body of Christ, the church. Uh, we love her well, and we wish her well, and we give our lives so that she will be well. There's, so there are so many things that bring us together. Now, the joy of being here with you as students, knowing what a very important moment this is for you, and, and wishing much that in your lives you will have put in place those elements that will stand you in good stead for ministry for the years ahead. Those of us that are at the end of our full vocational life, we look back and we recognize how indispensable those moments and those faculty and those peers have been to us. And so to be here and to have some moment of just dropping into your mind and hearts some seeds of ideas uh, for me is a, is a joy. So thank you for the opportunity of, of being with you and for your incredible warmth to me. My one regret is that Lily hadn't come. And I, uh, we, they put us in this lovely B&B &B and my wife is one of those persons that love all the schmuck that goes with B&Bs. And, B &B &Bs. and, and uh, frankly, I do too. And when I walked in there Saturday night, I, I called Lily and I said, you would love to be here with me, uh, but maybe another time we can do that couple of things that I want to just say at the, at the outset. One is last night, you know, sometimes, when we were having dinner Sunday night, uh, Carol Ann and uh, Wilma and I, we got talking about learning, uh, how brains operate, and, uh, and uh, Carol Ann said, well, you know, we think as we talk. Talking forces us to think. But sometimes some of us think after we've spoken. And as we went last night, I thought there, were, there was a response I made to a question that I think was quite unfair. And it was my comment about the last two years of ministry at Tyndale. And I, I just, for the record, I need to be fair to the people I work with, to my 10 years experience. I've had a wonderful experience with a board that has been more than supportive, have been generous, have been helpful. A faculty that have borne the weight of the burden of bankruptcy and by low wages and, and, and less than generous compensations, they have helped to carry the load. The Lord has given us a wonderful combination of, of, uh, of, of staff members that serve in many ways. And the, and the students have been a joy. The struggles that I have had are more of my own making. What I was really referring to last night was coming in from that which I was used to, the comfort zone of my life, where I really experienced joy in ministry. Being called to do something that I had not experienced in a business that I didn't understand, to do things that I really had no heart for. It was in that moment that God taught me something about call and the necessity of responding to call whether I liked it or not. So the issue with respect to these 10 years have been more the things that the Lord has taught me in an environment of love and acceptance and encouragement. So I just, I wanted to clarify that. You may not even heard what I said, but I know what I said, and in my own heart I had to bring clarification to that. Uh, let me just uh, do a quick rundown on the books that, that, that finally arrived. Uh, these are with 
HarperCollins, When Life Hurts, The Threefold Path to Healing. It is, uh, it is, uh, it is a, a book that deals with the, with the suffering and sorrow of, of our own lives out of suicide. And uh, when HarperCollins asked me for a book on suffering, uh, it was from that that I began to write. And uh, uh, this is, uh, I, I trust, is helpful for you as preachers. Uh, as a preacher, I write as a preacher. And so ideas fall naturally into sermons and illustrations, so that might be of help to you. What Happens When I Die, as I mentioned the other night, was not a book that I had planned to write, but HarperCollins said, we want a book on life after death. And this was a deeply enriching theological moment of struggling with the ideas. You see, when I started, I had in mind that all I had to do was find the pieces to the jigsaw puzzle in the New Testament, and it would, when I got them together, it would give me a pattern of heaven. I realized that was the wrong metaphor to work with. As I kept banging my head against a wall, and I realized, when I finished hearing, reading what Jesus said, I was really confused. Peter and Paul and John helped me a bit, but even so, I tried to cobble that together, and the, the picture still didn't, wasn't formatted. As I struggled with it, I realized I was coming at it in the wrong way, for I was assuming that something significant was transpiring between death and resurrection that almost obviated or re- eliminated the, the, the element of life today as having little to do with life after death. Simply, I came to this, this broader understanding from which I could then examine biblical text, and it was this, that heaven is the continuity of life as it was in Eden before the fall. It is a creation like that, in fact, it is that creation. In Adam we die, in Christ we're made alive. The intent of the Father will not be set aside by the works of evil. He will accomplish his purposes. And when I saw it from that vantage point, all of a sudden the biblical text became clear to me. And that's what, uh, that's what uh, that t- attempts to do. Uh, these next two books are with... Uh, Fortress, actually, uh, um, this, this one book, uh, this Castle Key books is, a, is owned by uh, Fortress Augsburg in Minneapolis. Jesus and Caesar, Christians in the Public Square. This is an attempt to ask the question, or answer the question, what's the role of Christians within the public square? What do we as people of God think about, or how do we think about, and how do we respond to the issues within, within uh, public policy and government? Uh, and then this one that just came out last week, Preaching Parables to the Postmodern, and I think that's self-explanatory. So uh, I'd be glad to sign those for you or as a gift or however you want to uh, access those. Now, those of you that are lecturers, you know the problems that one has as a preacher in lecturing. You never are quite sure where to land. Tonight because I'm dealing with material that I haven't dealt with before, and it's material that I'm working on for a book that'll hopefully be coming out with uh, Josie Bass in a year's time. I'm going to stay fairly close to my notes. A preacher reading notes never really feels free. But I'm going to stick to my notes because I want to develop an argument that I hope will be of help to you at least to think about the nature of Christian leadership. Greenleaf wrote, Greenleaf wrote a book in 1977 called Servant Leadership. That book set in motion conversation and assumptions that ripple their way down through today. It's as if to be a servant leader says it all. We assume Greenleaf and other following his seminal book, they've tapped into a biblical truth so obvious as not as not warranting examination. The assumption is that the prime and define, defining modifier of leadership from the lips and life of Jesus can alone be servant. And so servanthood has become for many the prime way of understanding leadership. Greenleaf said, I quote, my greater joy is that, that more of those who are natural servants who get joy of our serving will become aggressive builders of serving institutions, end of quote. Embedded in his assumptions are that people with a servant's heart can become leaders. 
I think the kingdom works the opposite. It takes those gifted to lead and transforms the person in grafting into the stem of the person's life a servant's heart. Christians gifted to lead come to understand leading, indeed living, is to be lived in humility, as Paul, as the Apostle Paul noted, Philippians 2. Do nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit, but in humility consider other, others better than yourself. Each of you should look not only to your own interest, but also to the interests of others. We're, we are to submit our lives to the constraints of his calling. We serve him, and in so doing, serve the world of his doing. It began in the garden. We were called as co-managers into creation. And this co-managerial role was by its nature a calling to understand and look after the earthbound creation. Old Testament laws were crafted so as to inhibit unfair treatment, requiring leadership to be responsive to Yahweh's call. Leaders in Israel's life were to care for the needs of the people, offering wisdom, ensuring justice, building a society in which people would be, would be treated fairly and in security. Jesus, as the fulfillment of the law, makes the call even more explicit by demonstrating the ultimate act, dying for his enemy. Now, we extrapolate from biblical texts an assumption that living with a servant's heart is, a, is particular only for Christian leadership. But surely that misses the point. Servanthood is a universal Christian calling. Thus, a leader like every Christian is to serve. So to say that one is to be a servant leader is to state the obvious. A Christian leader serves as should anyone who calls themselves by the name of Christ. Servanthood is but one, central, but only one characteristic of Christian leadership. But is it only for leaders? It is the common characteristic that should carry itself for all Christians. The unfortunate implication of Greenleaf's theses is that servants make the best leaders. Again, while Christian leaders are to be servant in spirit, to use quote-unquote servant as the prime modifier for leadership is to be blind to the notion of the gift of leadership and what God requires of those who lead. And further, it misses what I believe to be the central dynamic of kingdom life. Yes, Jesus became a servant and made it clear that, too, was to be our ruling paradigm. As a crucified one, he continued as Lord of life. And as much as we are giving latitudes to make choices, latitude to make choices, and even as he did while on earth, set aside his right and prerogative to rule with defining power, remember he still is God of creation and Lord of life, and we aren't. Our understanding of servanthood as a ruling vision of Christian life it still operates within this wider framework of creational authority. Understanding this matters. It sets being a servant within that understanding. Biblical leadership does have a, a creational mandate. The giftings of the Spirit come from God to us so that we will use them for kingdom life. He has put in place leadership, always operating as servants, both in spirit and in action. This does not permit one to lead dictatorially or to assume that authority makes one impenetrable. The New Testament metaphors remind us by the, by the metaphor of body that we are a fellowship, we are not a business. But even so, pastors are responsible to the Lord and to the body for their leadership. And so let me just be clear at the, at the beginning. We're called to be stewards of his creation. Jesus made it clear to where, where to use the towel. Jesus fits us all for the role of servanthood. However, to make it the only modifier of leadership is misleading. Again, let me say, we are called to be servants. Jesus said it. In demonstrating servanthood, he continued his feet washing of the disciples with, Now that I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you should wash one another's feet. I have set you an example that you should do as I have done for you. John 13, 14. He responds to the mother of Zebedee, who asked that her sons, his disciples, be given special honor in the kingdom with this, with this sharp rebuke. Whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. And whoever wants to be first must be your slave. Just as the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. Matthew 20, 26. Anyone who chooses to follow Jesus is inevitably challenged by what he did. 
antithetical to his culture, foreign to the invading nations that held Israel captive, he shows them a countercultural model. As he came to be a servant, so we, his followers, are to be servants. It thus follows that leaders, at least those who call themselves by Jesus' name, too, are to be servants. Now, the question I've asked in these years since reading Greenleaf's material, and sometimes you never really get to answering a question until you have to do a sermon or, a, or, a, or, a, or an essay or a book on it. But as I thought about Greenleaf's material and the countless books and articles sounding the theses that Christian leaders are primarily defined as servants is this. What then are we to do? You see, leaders with a serving spirit, for all Christian leaders should be servants, are to do something. In our serving as leaders, what might Christ expect of us? You see, he didn't come as a servant and then do nothing. So my interest is this. As a leader, what am I to do in leading? I think a good place to start is a mission statement. What's the mission statement of Jesus? When I came to Tyndale 10 years ago, I knew that what was needed was a mission statement. They had ideas of who they, who they wanted to be, what they were doing. But we had two schools, an undergraduate and a seminary. And so what we did was spend a number of months. We agreed we would come up with a short statement that we could easily memorize. It had to be under 20 words. And it's one thing to do a sermon of 40 minutes but the hardest thing in the world is to do a sermon of five minutes. A mission statement is a challenge. So we came up with a simple mission statement. To educate and equip Christians to serve the world with passion for Jesus Christ. Now, I have fun exegeting that mission statement. We'll leave that for my next lectureship here. What was the mission of Jesus? What was he all about? What was at the very heart of his coming. Well, we don't go very far in the Gospels till we find what it is. Matthew. He said early, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven is near. Matthew 4.17. As he moved up into Galilee, going into synagogues, Matthew writes, preaching the good news of the kingdom. Matthew 4.32. You go over to Mark, and he points to Jesus marching from his encounter with Satan, speaking with those who would listen, quote, The kingdom of God is near. Repent and believe the good news. Mark 1, 15. Trace through his life, and time after time, we learn his mission was to introduce his kingdom. That was his calling. That's what he articulated, and that's what's ours as well. Christian leadership is to do what he came to do. And what did his kingdom do? What did his kingdom do? It transformed. It recreated. A fix-up was not enough. When you get home tonight, take the scriptures, or in the middle of your lecture tomorrow, no, no, don't do that. Take the scriptures, any one of the Gospels, and Acts, and just flip through the pages and look at the headings. And what's the common denominator of all of those sections? Whether it's the actions or the teachings of Jesus. It's transformation. Healings. Deliverance. From the demonic. Feeding of large group. Walking on water. The list goes on. And then you come to the Sermon on the Mount. And as, uh, as Jonathan Wilson said yesterday, the Sermon on the Mount or the teachings of Jesus takes that which is turned upside down, and turns it the right side up. The teachings are radical. They're transforming. They are changing. It's not a covering of therapy to generate good feelings. Rather, he takes us from where we are, where people were, to where he wills them to go. Note his words with the Jewish scholar Nicodemus. It couldn't be clearer. He said, until you are changed from above, you will know nothing about this kingdom. In response to Nicodemus's question, 
We know you are a wise person, but where do you come from and what are you about? Uh, I love, I think what is, what is, what is uh, central to the understanding of the kingdom is the parable of the seed. And Jesus said, unless a corn of wheat fall into the ground and dies, but if it dies, it forever remembers single. But when it dies, well, it doesn't really, but it smells like it, it looks like it, it feels like it. Unless it dies, it won't reproduce. The kingdom isn't about armies or bank accounts or national boundaries. It isn't that the kingdom does not affect them, but the kingdom is really about his reign. The kingdom. What's the kingdom? It's about the king and his domain. Kingdom. The domain of the king. And what's the domain of the king? His creation. As Abraham Kuyper reminded us that there's not one square inch of creation that God doesn't say, mine. So, any modifier, servant leadership, visionary leadership, loving leadership, honest leadership, it describes the how of leading. They importantly illustrate the characteristics needed in how one leads as a Christian. But what my plea is and what I need to know is what is a modifier that describes what is being attempted. Servant leadership describes the transactional component of our relationship. A servant serves the Lord, the King. And in that sense, we need to be reminded, as Paul said, I am a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ. So servanthood ultimately founds, finds itself in the transcendent. But within our relationship to the one we serve, there's a certain transaction. We give and receive. And that's important. For in the process of leading, we are transactional in that we give and we receive. We are relational. That's how a servant works. That's how a servant leader works. That's how a Christian works, for all Christians are also servants. But then I ask, what do we do? And I find that the servant modifier, as important as it is in describing how I should live, it doesn't describe for me as a Christian leader what is, expect, what is the expected outcome. And all that Jesus was in his life, and out of all he has taught us about his concerns of the kingdom, by his very life and example, he left the world differently than when he arrived. He left people changed after their encounter with him. His call to his followers are to be different, to live in line with the essence and the character of his announced kingdom. They led the newly forming community of faith into a life of transformation. Notice, notice what happens in Thessalonica. A mob turned out against Paul and Silas. And they said, these have, who have caused trouble all over the world have now come here. Oh, that God would say that is about, about us. Servant leadership is one of a number of important descriptions of what it means to be a Christian leader. However, it seems to me that Transforming leadership describes the object of leading. Servant leadership describes the, the how, and transforming describes the what. We lead as servants, but our intent is transformation. It's gradual and at times imperceptible, but transformation it is. You know, a person may have teaching as a gift, but if your intent as a teacher is simply to get them to the course where they can pass the grade so they can move on to the next level, that's not transformation. But if in teaching your hope is transformation, that person seeing the kingdom ways, then in every sense you're a transformational leader. You see, when we interact with this kingdom, we are never the same. Touch the Lord and feel his love. Sit in his presence and sense his forgiveness. Walk, to war, walk forward in faith, all the while holding on to his arm of strength. But whatever you do, don't pretend you're a kingdom leader and live without expectation that God in Christ is reconciling the world, that in the power of the Spirit, he is renewing, changing, moving forward, transforming his people, those he loves and the world he calls his own. 
that we see this Jesus taking the suffering and bringing healing, taking the inquirer and giving them confidence, taking the broken and knitting them back together, calling back that lost son back into the home, that lost daughter that's wandered away, going for that sheep that has fallen aside and leaving the 99 and bringing them back. Wherever he, his kingdom went, people were changed. And kingdom leadership is expecting his renewing life to transform our people, our world, and you and I in his time and way. And so as much as the Canadian church and its many-membered ministries need leaders with servant hearts, we need more than that. The kingdom always has. Leadership is to affect his kingdom rule. Our task goes beyond the running and the maintenance of the group we're called to lead. It's to affect people, systems, societies, and the environment by his rule. And we are to do it his way. Whoever he touched, whatever he said, was to transform. So leaders in his name, we are about transformation. I think there's nothing that so characterizes Christian leadership as transformation. Yes, servants. That's our MO. That's our modus operandi. Let me suggest six important characteristics of transforming leadership. First of all, a transforming leader confronts death that results from giving into the status quo. We understand that the status quo is death. I love that little line in Hebrews 11, the story of faith, the chapter of faith. It describes faith and it works its way down through a variety of examples. Enoch, Noah, Abraham. Abraham was called to go out from where he was. He was called to leave. There was movement involved in the call. Being stuck in the status quo does not live in the expectation of change. I get asked, Dr. Lee, and I'm sure as you do as well, we need leaders. I get calls on a regular basis from congregations, from missions, from ministries. We're looking for a CEO. We're looking for a president. We're looking for a principal. And the question inevitably becomes, where are our leaders? We have many who can lead meetings and organize events. But to find a transformational leader is to find someone who can see the death-inducing spirit of the status quo. Religious circles tend to foster the comfort of things continuing to be as they have always been. Churches tended by members whose likes and preferences become embedded in the form and structure get stuck in the maze of their own memories. Songs precious to their walk of faith becomes the only ones we are permitted to sing. But creation surely is about renewal. Every fall the plants die. The leaves fall off. The grass turns brown. The snow comes. Then the melting comes. It felt and smelt like that today, didn't it? Spring comes. Plants come back to life. Trees bloom with leaves and the green and the grass turns lush green. So why do we think organizations should stay as they are? You can tell a transformational leader by their lack of comfort with things as they are. Secondly, leaders are not just about change for the sake of change. They're trying to build something new so everyone can see, not so everyone can see what they have done. Transformational leaders are not about themselves, they're about vision. A little story out of Moncton some years ago. I have a sister-in-law and her husband who were pastors of the Presbyterian Church in Sackville. They told me about a Lillian Marshall 
She was a member, I think, of one of your churches in Moncton. It was a Sunday night service. Bob, you know her? I met her sometime later. I wanted to meet this little lady, Pierre. Pierre Allard, thank you. Pierre Allard was chaplain at Dorchester. It was a Sunday night. It was a missionary service, as I understand, at the church. They were singing some of the songs, possibly like, I'll go where you want me to go, dear Lord. You want to tape that? We can maybe try and sell that as long as the books, uh, Carol Ann. <laughs> and her thought was, Lord, what can I do? I'm a grandmother. My husband is dead. What can I do? The next morning, her pastor called and said, Lillian, there's a woman coming from Alberta. She has a son at Dorchester. She's got no one to stay with her. Uh, someone nowhere to stay. Could she stay with you? And Lillian said, I'd love to have her. Lillian had a little uh, insurance brokerage firm. And she was maintaining it just because she, she was a high energy person, needed something to do. The woman came and stayed with her. And as she was going back some days or weeks later, she said, Lillian, there's no one to visit my son. Would you be willing to? Lillian went down to the Dorchester one day, a little nervous, had never walked. Well, you know what the old one was, about 25 miles out of, out of Moncton up there on the side of the valley, that old-looking, frightful monster of a fortress. She said, I walked in, the doors clanged behind me, and she said, I saw a young man across the waiting room. And as I walked toward him, she said, I heard the words, Woman, behold your son. And I looked at him, and the first moment I looked at him, I loved him. And she began to visit with him. Others wanted her to visit them as well. The wonderful thing about, of course, Lillian is that she was of a particular age. I don't want to offend anybody here tonight, and I want to get out of here alive. But she was old enough. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. And there was no other kind of interest from these young men except to be loved by a grandmother. But it was her vision for, the, for those young men and her belief that God would bring transformation. Remember Pierre Allard said, something remarkable happened in Dorchester those couple of years. He said, drug rates were reduced. He said, guards started taking lifers home on their day off. And he said, it's one thing when God touches the life of the lifers, but when he touches the life of the guards, you know he's doing something. <laughs> Transformation leadership works out of vision. We talked about that more extensively on Monday night. Vision is the means whereby we see what can be done. Today, John and I, we had lunch together, and we talked about his church in Kentville and about his own vision for health in churches. It's a great vision, John. He's looking at churches not so much in just the problem-solving, but beyond the problem-solving to ask, what characterizes a healthy church? As the pastor said, Rick Warren, as a matter of fact, he said, when I came, when I started the church, I decided not to worry about the front door. He said, I thought I'll only worry about the back door because if I can take back care of the back door, the front door will look after itself. And we have a church of life and energy and health. The church will grow because healthy bodies reproduce. It's a great vision. Nurture that vision. And let your life be lived within the context and framework of that vision. Because that vision has inherent within it the possibilities that God will bring transformation. Transformational leaders also describe what is and what will be. Transformational leaders know that a mighty tree does, after all, start with something very insignificant, that acorn. Transformational leaders begin with what is. They see the point from which the ministry will move. Oh, it takes time to reflect and learn, to put in place the thing that will give the leader and the team an objective assessment of what actually does exist. Especially for those brought in from the outside, that ability to assess is critical for a long-term ability to fulfill the mission. Now, if one has been raised in a place where he or she, he or, she is now leading, the clarity becomes more difficult. For if one has worked or lived within that group, there is an accompanying fuzziness 
about what actually exists, what the current state of ministry really is. So if an internal person is asked to lead, it's helpful to have someone from the outside look at what is with the eyes of others than, other than those who have seen it, who with years of tinted lenses see it in a particular way. Transformational leaders also have a respect for what is. I found when I came into the school of a, of a hundred and some years, I had really no acquaintance to the school. I'd preached there a few times, but I had no understanding of its ethos. It wasn't my school undergraduate, graduate, or postgraduate. What it took for me was to, was to understand its history, figure out its ethos, so that I could grow where it was planted. It required that. But after you examine what is, or if you're a newcomer to learn what it has been, the next step is to set a course as to what will be. I have a simple theory. Leaders describe what is and what will be. What is and what will be. It fits very much within the framework of my message this morning, what the sons of Issachar. They had an understanding of the times. They know what is. To know what Israel ought to do, what will be. Describing what is is simply good management. To describe what will be is vision filled with faith for accomplishment. When I arrived at Tyndale 10 years ago, forgive me for the experiences, but it's the best way that I can describe. For this stuff comes out of my own life and experience in my attempt to understand the biblical call of leadership. We have a cottage north of Peterborough. It's been a family cottage for years. I love, I love the bush country. I love dog sledding. I love skidooing. I love living at, the, living at the lake, living out in the countryside. Lily was up there. She loves it too. And she said, well, you're... And I lost my holidays that summer. And she said, well, do you mind if I go up to the cottage? And I said, no, that's fine. I'll stay here alone in the heat of Toronto and sleep in the bed alone, you know. With joy, I'll let you go. <laughs> My brother David, who was, who was a businessman, I invited to come down to London. Cause from London, I needed someone to take over finance to make sense of, of the, 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 the tangled realities of, of what had been going on. So David moved down we lived together. It was one night. It was one of those awful southern Ontario July nights. Awful. I'm a prairie boy. I love the dry heat. This, this dripping, humid heat. I'd gone to bed. I was like Paul. I didn't know whether I was in the seventh heaven or whether I was just having a bad dream. Not quite what Paul said, but nice to be associated with him. And I was praying and thinking and dreaming. And I remember saying, Lord, what in the world did you ever get me in this mess for? I, I've never seen anything so tangled. And during that night, the Lord formatted in my mind what would be. At breakfast in the morning, I said, David, I know now where we're going. He said, what are you talking about? And so I told him what had happened, what I had learned. And I drew out for him on a piece of paper where we would go. The school needed it. I needed it. Transformational leader believes that he or she is given the responsibility to create what now isn't, but well could be. We call people to look up from the disaster at hand and see that in God's good time, with reliance in his provision and guidance, what has been described is and what will we work towards. But fourthly, transformational leaders love or at least learn to love their ministry. It's more than a job. That's why transformational leadership is more than technique. 
You can read all the books that you can find. You can take all the courses available. Yet without a deep love and affection for the work, you will organize and manage but not bring a transforming presence. No matter how homely, disfigured, or inept the work is, it requires you and I to put our arms a love around it and own it. Again, I go back to that experience of, of, of working with the school. It's something I had no interest in. It was, it, you know, this, the school didn't even catch my passing interest. As a, and as a married man of some 42 years, I confess now and then, as I walk down the streets, there are people that catch my passing interest. You know, I'm not that blind. We're that dead. <laughs> but this school didn't catch my interest at all. I was embarrassed about it. It was, it, was, it was a Bible college that should have been thinking about being a university 20 years before. Its, its usefulness as a 20th century ideal had run out of steam. But I realized that one of the things I had to do was say that I loved her. You know, I found after 42 years of marriage, sometimes you always don't feel loving. Right? Is this true for you, TV? No. <laughs> no, not for you either, Andrew, is it? Yeah. Of course it's true. Sometimes we just, we're irritated, we're annoyed, we're ticked off. And in those moments, what we do, we affirm our love because that's what's ultimately true and we're going to bring our feelings in line with that which we believe should be true and by God's help, it will be true. And I found myself, you know, I, 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 as I think back, I feel like I'm a bit of an, a bit of an, been, I've been a bit of an emotional basket case in trying to figure out how to leave and lead in this environment. But I had such love with what I had done before. However, one day, I was preparing a, uh, a leadership message to, to the, Christians, the Association for Christian Schools, ACSI. And in my preparation, I came across an article that had a line from Bill Hybels. The line jumped out on me. I wrote it, and I, and I taped it in the front of my Bible. In that new moment, I knew I had to set aside what I would rather do. The Lord had given me assignment, and I had to learn to love it. Here's what he said. Subordinate your own life's agenda in order to carry out the vision he has given you. As a transformational leader, we've got to subordinate our own personal agenda. When God brings you to a people, to a ministry, to a congregation, to a group of young people, as motley and pimply-faced as they are, as annoying and irritating as they can be, he asks us to put our arms around them and love them. You see, I had lived as a bipolar person. <laughs> My bipolarity was interest and desire and calling. And I allowed, allowed this bifurcation, this division, this bipolarity to exist in my life. And it was creating confusion, annoyance, despair. It was fracturing my life. And when I read that, I knew the Lord had spoken to me. And I had to bring about change in my life. I had to make some decisions and to love is an act of the will. And the ministries, the people that we serve in leadership will never experience transformation until they know that we will love them at all costs. Fifthly, transformational leaders lead with a sense of urgency. Somewhere in the organization or ministry, there needs to be urgency in the wings. Remember, this is about the kingdom. We don't have all day or all century. In the academic world, the calendar rules. 
Student orientation, faculty retreat, convocation, starts of classes, faculty meetings, board of governor meetings, and the rest of the year is set in stone. One can fall into the habit of just showing up and filling in. True for pastoral life as well? Special events, Sunday sermon prep, staff meetings, weddings, funerals, visitations, the hospital, and it goes on and on. And a yoke of duty settles on our shoulders and we plod on. We assume that if we just keep up the schedule and meet deadlines, kingdom life will appear. That won't happen. A a dull, suffocating routine is what will emerge. Now, a sense of urgency is not the same as an annoying, grating sound of impatience. The two are not the same. Ministry is about destiny. Essential to the evangelical message is eschatology, an understanding that life is moving on a linear line to an eventual wrap-up of history. We aren't trapped in a cycle, but we move towards the inevitable ending in which we will give account of what we do. This moment of accountability is not a threat, but it's a natural part of the system of management. Someday we'll stand before the Lord and give an account of our lives. Leaders have a special, in my view, responsibility of accounting as their gifts make them responsible for what's been done beyond the individual. I know I have limited time in my leadership, limited either by a set time allotted by the trustees or by life itself. Each day the organization sits in complacency is another kingdom day wasted. Integrity must be integral to urgency or we just become busy people. Sixthly, transformational leaders understand that only by the Spirit can transformation take place. I know as leaders, we fall into the trap of manipulation. We have the skills. It's inherent in us. We figure out where we want to be, and we look at people and organizations and systems, and we figure if we can just kind of manipulate and retool and move around, and we do it all the time. Manipulation isn't always a bad thing. It's not necessarily pejorative. We, we have to manage the system. There are certain levers that, levers, that leaders have to, 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 to change. I know within our school, my two levers are organization, the way it's organized, and my senior vice presidents. That's the way I influence the organization. Be filled with the Spirit is to rely on His presence and counsel. And this is one of my acknowledged acknowledged shortcomings. I've got a strong work ethic to a fault. It's almost as if I'm not sure that He'll show up. So to compensate for that uncertainty and to ensure our, our, our success, I get up earlier and I work harder. Now, I was raised in a church that talks much about the work and life of the Spirit. But I still that the Spirit is already ahead of us, preparing and leveling the ground. Even though we have lived in North America for a, a century within a broader, broader understanding of the Spirit, we still struggle to understand. We were talking at dinner tonight, and Lee, you were saying that you still haven't read a real good theology of the Spirit. Because there is a mystery to God, and if we had God figured out, He would no longer be God. But as well, we must not be spooked by the Spirit. We must not be afraid of the Spirit. The Spirit is God. He is Trinity. He works in mysterious ways. He works in unknown ways. But He also works at times in perceptible ways. And as we look at the world and the church that we've we've been called to serve... We understand that as much as we do, as careful as we go about organization, as much as we try and and ensure that our hearts really are hearts of servants, as much as we design vision and we we live with 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 a commitment to see transformation occur, as much and as good as we do, we realize that without the Spirit we are helpless. Because we are doing the work of the King. 
And the work of the king must ultimately be done in the way that he wants by his power. It is, the kingdom is really the domain of the king. We are operating within that domain and the spirit has been sent by the triune God to be the agency of Yahweh, Jehovah, in our lives, in society, within community, to bring about Christ-likeness, the transformation, the healing, the wholeness, the health. I need to understand what it means to step back. These, tip, these type A personalities have a hard time doing that. To step back. Say, Spirit of God, rule and reign. I want to give space in my heart and here in this ministry for your rule and reign. It's a great challenge to be a Christian leader in the 21st century. It's tough. It's messy. At times discouraging. But as you as he has called you and you and you and you and you. He's called you because he's chosen to call you. He sees in you what others may not see. He sees in you that you and I might not see in ourselves. But he's called you. He's made you his child. He's lifted you from your own moral failings. He has infilled you with his own Holy Spirit of God. And he calls us to lead the people of God in our own places, in our own ways. My prayer is that in our country, in the 21st century, we will settle for nothing less in our own lives and the lives of our church, for nothing less than transformational leaders. It isn't that we do the transforming, but within the expectations of our role, we expect the Spirit of God to bring transforming, His transforming presence to life of the individual, to the life of the church, and the community, and the society. May God give us courage to allow Him to make us transforming. Through Christ, we give thanks and praise. It's a holy calling. We know we aren't worthy. But in your supreme wisdom and rule, within the sublime wisdom of your own being, you allow us, you order us, you instruct us, you move us out. Father, thank you for my sisters and brothers here for their heart and their vision. May we, in our own way, not defined by somebody else's rules or comparing ourselves to anyone else, but within the heart of hearts of our own being, within the gifts of our own capacities, within the environment of our own calling, may we discover that newness of your spirit to recreate, to transform, to make alive again, to renew that the church of Jesus Christ in our communities will be strong, effective voices, bodies, presence, witness of the living Christ whom we love. We give thanks to your name and your name alone.